Dick Carver. Say the secret, White, and you win $100. No, you divide $100 between you. That's what it was. I, I'm sorry, that's someone else's line, not mine. Uh, how are you? Welcome to the show and to picturesque 58th Street in New York. This is some street we're on, isn't it? I have never mentioned it much before. The man who wrote um, Every Street's a Boulevard in Old New York saw this street and burned his piano, I, I'm told. Really something. Uh, can you hear me in the balcony? How do the people who say no know what I ask? <laughs> they have never figured this out. Um, besides Mr. Marks, we have uh, Truman Capote's here tonight, and Jim Fowler. Jim Fowler, you know, has uh, always brings an animal. I'm not allowed to tell you what sort of animal he has brought tonight, but the people in the balcony will be glad to know that it likes to attack people close to the ground. <laughs> so it's nice to... He had a boa constrictor here earlier, but uh, it got loose somewhere, and so we don't... <laughs> so, to the lady who complained to the page that the fire hose was bothering her... <laughs> we, uh, don't have a fire hose. <laughs> anyway. Uh, let's just... The quick... The big news, of course, is that the Food and Drug Administration... <laughs> this isn't very big news. Uh, has said that everything has to be named from the place it came from. That's in today's paper, and probably the least exciting news item of the day. Like Boston baked beans have to come from Boston, Idaho potatoes. The, the, this has worried sick, the executives uh, in the valley of the Jolly Green Giant. This is actually uh, an actual law. And the executives of Mars bars are panicking. <laughs> it's a wonderful law. You know that terrible sense of panic you get when you're eating a... Idaho potato and think it might have come from Montana. I'm so glad they passed it. What else? Have you noticed that the concern with truth in packaging has come along at the same time as the no bra fad? <laughs> is, there, is there a joke there? I'm just asking. I don't know. There may be a joke in that. I haven't struck it yet, but there may be. Say, my dumb cousin Norman, I've mentioned, he's in trouble with the law. Uh, he uh, was coming east from Chicago on the bus, and in... Uh, I think it was in Detroit. They said, you change here for New York, and he started to undress. <laughs> and, uh, just a joke to see if you, were, uh, if you could tell a joke from real things. Say, Martha Mitchell and J. Edgar Hoover appeared at that dinner in Washington last night. Did you see about that? And Martha Mitchell said a profound thing. She said, when you've seen one director of the FBI, you've seen them all. Did you, did you see that? She did. Got a big laugh. Uh, what else? There's another thing in the paper, that tall men make more money. A professor at the University of Pittsburgh did a study, that's true. It said that they get higher starting salaries at companies. Uh, I resent this sort of news item. Um, the fact that he studied the Knicks, the Lakers, and the Celtics. To become, to become, no, he really did. And when you think about it, it probably is true. I mean, have you ever had a man come up to you on the street and say, can I borrow $10, I'm a little tall? No. <laughs> Are these the same people who were smiling and applauding earlier? There's a subject I do not know how to broach with you, but it's come up. Several people sent clippings in from the paper. This age, sex has been so abused, this age that we live in, as you know. And the latest thing is, is probably the capper of them all. Have you heard of this thing called the sex bowl that's going to take place in the East? Yeah, it, it is. I'm not making this up. It's, it's going to be on closed-circuit television, <laughs> luckily. And various... I'm trying to explain this tastefully. Various uh, couples would do what you would expect in a sex bowl, uh, would, and they're supposed to be graded. Is this appalling? Are they going to grade it like college? I mean, originality, neatness, and grasp of subject? Or I just, I've got to know what this is. It's absurd. I don't know. I don't want to go on with this. Listen, uh, there's a man backstage who's making everyone laugh with a cigar and mustache, and why Truman Capote is dressed that way, I don't know. Uh, so we'll be right back. 
If there had not been a night at the opera, a day at the races, and duck soup, and room service, and coconuts, and animal crackers, and a few other films, uh, the world would be a much worse place to live in. Uh, the word great is tossed around a lot, and the word giant, but uh, my next guest is one of the greats and one of the giants. Will you welcome, please, the one, the only, Groucho Marx. <laughs> Time that yeah. could be used for much better purposes. <laughs> I have a few sex stories that I'd like to tell you. <laughs> as soon as he leaves the stage. I, uh, How are you? I, I, it's very How nice to you. How did you find fine. things in, in London? Uh, they were fine. The fog lifted and there they were. Uh, isn't that a, an old joke? How did you, uh, yeah, perhaps, how did you find yes. London? I'm so accustomed to old jokes, I don't even pay any attention anymore. <laughs> I couldn't help noticing your hat, which uh, you've worn. <laughs> More than once here. And I, I, I wear that because there was a time where the hair was receding so swiftly mm -hmm. and I wore a toupee. And I, I saw that. myself on the show once wearing a toupee. It was ridiculous. Just a big, greasy looking smooth spot up there. Yeah. There's no point to that. So I had a, I used this hat actually to play golf. Yeah. Is I it could a tell you a golf story if you'd like to hear it? Well, I wouldn't mind that. It's a, uh, I'm not crazy about it, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. I, I, who gave you the hat? I was just wondering uh, whose taste I that bought is. it at the Hillcrest Country Club. You did? Yeah, I yeah. think I paid about two and a half bucks for it. They had seen me play mm -hmm. and decided that I'd need the appropriate costume for the way I played golf. <laughs> That's this it. is true, and I've worn yeah. it ever since. But I tell you why. I always say to the man who runs the show, the man who obstructs it, I mean, that uh, I always ask them to ask me why I wear this. Uh -huh. Because otherwise it looks like you're coming out just to see how funny you can be. I and don't know why I think that's would. ridiculous, you know. Yeah. The average grown-up person shouldn't have to wear a hat with three balls on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Aren't oh, they? yeah, there are three. I thought well, there for a moment three, there yeah. were not. I don't um, but one of them's I didn't mean it for a dirty story. No, I? I'm sure you didn't, no. Because I don't tell dirty stories. I feel very sensitive about that subject. You've said that before. If this that is you, true, and I'd, you, uh, like to, I'd like to talk about it for a couple of minutes. Well, no, I'm know. serious. There's a sure. show in town, I understand, where they practically do the sex act on the stage. I don't want to identify the name of the show. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all know about it. There's more than one. Well, this one was uh, written, I think, by the guy who was the leading dramatic reviewer in London. Designed by him. Designed. That's what they say in the program, designed. Oh, by he didn't write it, huh? Well, he wrote some of it. Well, yeah. I, I hadn't seen it. I, yeah. had, I was offered the seat to go to see it, but I heard it was filthy and I wouldn't go, that's all. Yeah. Because I think that's, that's too easy, that kind of laughter. Anybody can say something dirty and get a laugh. Mm -hmm. But say something clean and get a laugh. That requires a comedian. <laughs> I wasn't looking at you at the minute. I no, I didn't. <laughs> Although so I had you looked you, like you were. No, I had you in mind. <laughs> oh, well, I, I thought I could tell but that. But this is true, and I think it's about time they quit it. Huh. The movies are all dirty. Most of the stage plays on Broadway are dirty. And I think it's all wrong, because it doesn't require talent to be dirty. Be clean and be funny, that's all. But I do think it's had its day. I think they're going to go back to clean movies and clean plays on the stage. I think we're starting into another Victorian age, maybe? Well, that wouldn't be so terrible. No, it wouldn't. I have a feeling that people were... Uh, certainly, sex was more um, desirable then than it is now, because it's, it's like... No, I the, wouldn't say that. I... <laughs> Well, I, 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 
<laughs> There's something about sex that, uh, you know, but you have to get up so early in the morning. You do? It's hard to catch a train that way. I don't know where it was. Well, there used to be a joke about that. Oh, is that the punchline of a famous joke? Yes, uh, the, where the, oh, yeah. the yeah. husband says to the wife, you and your morning stuff. Mm. That's why you missed the train last week. Oh. I have to explain it more, but it's so dirty, I'm ashamed to say it. <laughs> After what you've just said, you can't tell it. No, but it is really yeah. true. I, I resent those shows and those yeah. movies, and I don't go see them. I saw one. It was called Something About a Housewife, with a very good actress in it, and a fellow named Benj Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Dick Benjamin. Dick Benjamin. And he was very good. He was a, a kind of a lousy husband. Yeah. And to, uh, in order for her to get even, she got another fellow. And then they spent 80 minutes of, of the movie in the sack, these two. Well, I'm not interested in that. I don't care what they're doing in the sack. If I'm not doing it, why should I sit in the corner? <laughs> I think you speak for the this majority of us. I think it's true. I think most people resent mm -hmm. the, the filth that goes on nowadays. Yeah. Well, it's in the common language today. Mm -hmm. You know, in the old days, uh, if there was a party and there were four women, four women and four men there, at the end of the meal, the men would probably go into another room and tell dirty stories, and there's nothing wrong with that. And the women would probably tell dirty stories in another room, too. <laughs> but they didn't tell them all together, that's yeah. all. There was a kind of a restriction about those things. It still exists in London, because I was over there a couple of years ago, and uh, I was at the ambassador's home many nights. Mm -hmm. The uh, ambassador then, I forget his name. It's not the fellow that is now the American. The one before that? Yes. Uh, Ambassador it's, Bruce? That's it, a charming guy and a charming. And after dinner, we had a very fancy dinner. A, uh, Kennedy's uh, widow was there, and. A lot of fancy people. And after dinner, when we got through eating, Churchill's daughter was there, Mary, lovely girl. She, oh, I must tell you about her. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, can you, will it take long? Because we have to take a message, and then we'll come right no, back. No, I'd be glad not to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Just my luck. Wait a minute. Well, I'll bring you right back to that. Well, anyhow, when yeah. I was in the embassy at their home, and what was his name? Bruce. Bruce. And after dinner, the men would go in one part of the house, and the women would go in the other part, and they'd smoke cigarettes and cigars and tell dirty stories, but they didn't tell them together. Yeah. That's all. And it seems so much nicer, if people are going to tell dirty stories, to confine themselves to that and leave the men alone. Let the men have their own fun in their own shoddy way. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Now. I was having dinner with Mary Churchill. Yeah. And I said, don't they save cigars at the embassy here? Yeah. This was Bruce's family. She said, of course. I said, well, why don't you ask one? So I got up and I said, uh, will you bring in the cigars, please? <laughs> so the butler came in with a big box of cigars. And I took a cigar. And she says, take one for me. I said, I don't know you smoke cigars. She says, oh, yes, never tell you about that. My father and I. We always, whenever I visited him at, what was it, Churchill Downs or? <laughs> it was, no, uh, that's a racetrack. Yeah. Well, oh, it was the uh, name something like that. Uh, his house. His house. 10 Downing Street? Yes. Because one night there, before I go ahead with this story, yeah. one night there, the, uh, they were running a movie in the projection room. And uh, that was the day that Hess was captured in Scotland. And oh, yeah. Churchill was running a day at the circus, one yeah. of our old pictures. Yeah. And some stooge came to the door and said, uh, we have just captured Hess, what, what'll we do? And they sent this message into Winston, and he says, let him wait till the goddamn picture's over. <laughs> it's true. But anyway. That's how we won World War II. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then, you know that she said, whenever I go to visit Daddy, she called him, mm -hmm. I would always take a cigar with me, and he would have a cigar, and then we would bet a pound who could hold the ash on the cigar the longer. Now, this was a guy that was running the whole empire. Yeah. 
<laughs> the only thing he was interested in, not in India or Pakistan or J Japan or any, he just wanted to win one pound. I on think it was three dollars at that time for Mary. Betting on an edge. Betting on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right at midnight. I don't expect that at six o'clock in the evening. <laughs> I'm surprised at you, college it is, man. It is nearly midnight. Yeah. Say, so are you ever sorry? <laughs> are you ever sorry you didn't go to go go through school? Yes, I am. Are very you? much. I tell you why. Because I was never much interested in acting. I always wanted to be a writer. I know. And I didn't finish public school, and yeah. I had no confidence in writing. Eventually, I wrote, I wrote five books. But if I'd have gone to college, I'd have been a writer much faster in my life, and probably a much better one, because I wasn't sure of grammar or English or anything else. So I didn't finish public school. But I have got a book in the Congressional Library in Washington. I know. But I don't know that you would have been any, uh, I mean, you're, you're better educated than a lot of college people. You know that. I'm not you, sure of that. I think no. you've, because you've read all your life, and you've made a yes, big point I have of educating read a lot. yourself. I was one of the first contributors to the New Yorker magazine under yeah. my name, which is Julius Henry Marx. Yeah. And I have the pieces home, which I had written for the New Yorker magazine. I was much prouder of that than I was in any play I'd ever been in, or in vaudeville, or in movies, or any place else. I always wanted to be a writer. Yeah. I hate to think of you being solely a writer, though, because then Captain Spaulding would have been played by Lloyd Nolan or something, and it wouldn't be the same. <laughs> Nothing against Lloyd. Nolan. No, what he has a nice there, and it's not bad either, according to Dave Frost. <laughs> I'm not going to get into this. <laughs> no, I don't think you, you, you wrote are. A, you wrote a. <laughs> now listen, Groucho, you wrote a. Uh, didn't you write a? <laughs> I'm going to keep talking here. Didn't you write a screenplay one time? I, I heard that you'd written a screenplay, and I it may be wrong. Have you ever written a screenplay? No. Oh, did you ever not write a screenplay? Frequently, a number of those that I actually did. Yeah. Did they no. ever take anything out of any of the films that you fought for to keep I in or suggest anything? That you... uh, who were in the chorus. No, no, I mean... The did ones they... that Chico hadn't grabbed by that time. Chico got most of the ladies, Chico, did he? Chico got most of the girls. Yes, he always did. Yeah. When he played the piano, and he had a kind of a flirtatious look on his face, and the dames would... They'd fall down, that's all. They were yeah. so crazy about him. And it took the rest of us four or five weeks while Chico were doing two nights. <laughs> he had an enormous amount of charm for women. Yeah, they say he was just fatal to women. Yes, uh, he was. Yeah. He was fatal to a number of them, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I always envied him because it always took me a long time to get a girl. Yeah. I usually had to get married first and pay out. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is true. Yeah. You did that number of times. Uh, Three times. Yeah. Now I am uh, half divorced. That's right. Backstage, last time you were here, you, were, you had some ailment and you were taking a pill for it. And just before the show, I said, uh, last time you wanted me to remind you to bring your pill. And you said, I did, my wife. Do you remember that? Now, did she get offended at things like that, uh, Eden? No, she's accustomed to it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't help it. I guess I'm a lousy husband. I've been married three times. And it's cost me a variable fortune. And I brought my, the woman I just divorced, I brought here with me. And we're living together in the hotel. Really? Yeah. That's scandalous. I don't think so. I, I, I'm very fond of her. Yeah. And she, lo <laughs> and she yeah. loves me, but uh, we don't hit it off if we're married. That and now that we're not married, we have a wonderful time together. Yeah. I've been all through Europe with her and South yeah. America and all. And we, we have wonderful memories of Paris and London mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Sweden and uh, Austria and Germany and all those places. Yeah. But if you take up a, a <laughs> fresh Tootsie, let's say, <laughs> yes. you have no conversation. Yeah. Now, Eden and I, that's her name, Eden. Her name is really Edna, but she changed it to Eden <laughs> because she thought that was fancier. Yeah. And the guy she was going with was named Edna. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let us take a message from our local stations, and maybe yeah. you'll sing something for us. We'll be back.
they can bring the house lights you know, up a I bit. You, kill myself right I noticed that you stepped yeah, on the edge of the stage. my insurance agent's in the front row. <laughs> if you'd fallen on him, it'd be ironic. Oh, he's fallen on me a number of times. <laughs> All the way back in 1929. What's his name? Salwin Shufro. You wouldn't believe this man. <laughs> Is it really? You know, when I call him up long distance from yeah. the coast, and he's in New York. And uh, I say, who do you want to talk to? She says, the operator. Uh -huh. And I say, I want to talk to Simon Shufro. She says, you're kidding, aren't you? There's nobody by that name. It's a made-up name, isn't it? I said, no, it isn't. I've been with him since 1929. And uh, he still ins insists on using this name. It's the most ridiculous name I ever heard. Simon Shufro. A grown-up man. Yeah. He weighs 170 pounds. And he's still named Salman Shufro. He's still named Salman. <laughs> what were you going to sing for us? I was going to sing, I want to sing a song that was written by Irving Berlin during the First World War. He's supposed to be watching the show tonight. Yes, he is. He told me that he was going to watch it tonight. Yeah. Now, I don't know the song well, but I'll fake my way through it. All right. Just for Berlin. It's yours. <laughs> Down below, down below, sat the devil talking to his son, who wanted to go up above, up above. He cried, it's getting too warm for me down here in snow, and so I'm going up on night where I can have a lot of fun. The devil simply shook his head and answered to his son, you stay down here where you belong. The folks who live above you, they don't know right from wrong. To please their kings, they've all gone off to war. And not a one of them knows what they're fighting for. Way up above, they say that I'm a devil and I'm bad. But the kings up there are bigger devils than your bad. They're breaking the hearts of mothers. They're making butchers out of brothers. You find more hell up there. And there is down here below. Cut it out, will you? I want to talk. How old is it? That's where I was. I'm 48. Thank you. One night, Irving Berlin, who I consider the greatest songwriter America's had, if he had only written Alexander's Ragtime Band. <laughs> but he also wrote many other songs, like God Bless America and uh, Call Me Madam. Well, I can remember how many songs he's written. He's written most of the great songs in this country, and he also wrote words and music. So he's quite a guy. And one night, he had come to California. And they gave him a big dinner, ASCAP. That's the musician's organization. And I had arranged with Harry Ruby, a close friend of mine, that I would sing this song that I just sang. And when I got through singing it, Irving Berlin called me over to the table. And he said, Groucho, if you ever have the urge to sing that song again, will you come to me and tell me that you want to sing it? And I'll give you $100 for every time you don't sing this song. <laughs> the first time. What do you uh, I just, I just want to say this in closing about this song. Sure, it sounds maybe corny today, but I want to tell you, it has a lot of truth in it today. When, that, when the musicians play, they're breaking the hearts of mothers making butchers out of brothers you'll find more hell up there than there is down here below 
Now just think of, just think of Vietnam and just think of all the places where the American soldiers have been. A couple of hundred thousand of them have been killed and wounded. Maybe he was a pretty good prophet, Irving Berlin, when he wrote this song 40 years ago. That's all. I just wanted to tell you. If it's the kind of a place I think it is. People, are, people at home must be wondering me. what. A lady yelled out, What's your telephone number? It's not a lady. People at home. Well, it's, I resent that word, lady. Lady. It's becoming very popular now. They say, Gee, she's a nice lady. Yeah. I prefer woman. Yeah, I that's right. I think it's much Ladies nicer are... for somebody to say, she's a fine woman, or she's a great woman or something. Huh. Woman means something. What is a lady? Ladies of value judgment, I suppose but you might say. You're but... much better educated <clears throat> than I am. Do you notice <clears throat> the frequency with which the word the women are now referred to as ladies? They say, gee, she's a great lady. She's a real great lady. I resent lady. that. Yes, I resent that. I think woman means something. Woman yeah. is like mother. Yeah. Would That's you right. agree There's with also that? also the women's lib women don't like the word ladies, so people are a little self-conscious about which well, to use. It's like, uh, it's well, like. Well, I don't like the women's lib. You know? Yeah. You may like. I think as long as they're willing to take alimony, they have no right to ask for women's lib. A lot of them don't want alimony. Yeah. And beside that, they should go to war. Not as soldiers necessarily, but mm -hmm. there are many jobs in the army and navy and other places where they could use women. Oh, women have gone to war. In, in Not a great deal. Yeah. In Lysistrata, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but that was for a specific reason. supposed to be reason. better educated yes. than you. Uh, hey, um, Groucho, nobody ever explains why the films were named what they were. Why coconuts? Why duck soup? Why animal crackers? Who thought well, was coconuts that? was named because the fellow who produced it was Sam Harris. Ah. And he was used. <laughs> He used to go to Florida every winter. And then oh, he would write yeah. us unfunny postcards about we were <laughs> knocking our brains out working on Broadway while mm. he was down in Florida drinking mint juleps. Yeah. So the first one was called Coconuts. And it was a, a lot about uh, Florida, about Florida yeah. and the Miami. Why duck soup then, animal crackers? Duck soup, there really was no logical reason for that at all. <laughs> But, yeah. you know, it was a comedy. It was about a war. Yeah. It wasn't as serious as the one we're still having. I know, it's a strange feeling to see it now because yeah, the It's a strange feeling I got yesterday uh, when looking at the front page of the New York Times and saw Johnson and Nixon walking towards the library. And they looked so proud and happy. What great things they have done. Johnson, Johnson lengthened the war six years. Nixon has started three wars since he's in there. <laughs> you still, uh, at one point, you had stopped reading the papers. He said it was just there was too much well, bad news. I, I, don't, I don't read the news uh, at yeah. night when I go to bed yeah. because it's just a remake of what's been going on all day. Yeah. Now. Uh, <laughs> And I want to hear it over again. Yeah. You know, and they show you a battlefield, and there are boys laying there dead and injured. And I don't want to see that when I go to bed at night. I have enough problems going to bed without that. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to tell a story about, uh, what was I going to tell you about? There was something you told me during the break. I forgot now which thing it was. I, I was going to, I asked you once if they uh, censored much of the stuff out of the films. You did talk about that one time. Um, no, and, uh, I think we had the cleanest it, movies yeah. that have ever been made. Oh, a story. Oh, there movies. is a story. Coconuts, I know Animal it. Crackers, all those pictures were clean. We never yeah. had any dirty dialogue. Occasionally, yeah. I'd make a play for Mrs. Rittenhouse. Yeah. But she never understood that. Why did they feel they had to put a romantic interest? I don't mean you and Margaret Dumont, Thorberg. but I mean Thorberg, in, yeah. in Night at the Opera, they had a love story, which gets yes, a lot did. of snickering. When they I'll see tell it, you what uh, Mike Nichols said. He, uh, we ran the picture, Night at the Opera. Mm -hmm. one night at Gregory Peck's house, and Mike Nichols was one of the guests there. And when the picture was over, he uh, came over to me and he says, that's the 17th time I've seen this picture. Yeah. And I said, that's kind of silly, isn't it, to watch any picture 17 times? 
No, he said it was worth it. I'll tell you why. It had the greatest love story you fellas have ever had in any of the movies. <laughs> this was Alan Jones and yeah. Kitty Carlisle. Was... So you can imagine that love story. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice people, I'm sure. It does get in snickers, are. though, when you see the... Yes, uh, it does. The it's ridiculous. Yeah. But Thorberg had a theory that if the audience is rooting for you, more mm. people will come to the theater. And he was right. Because before that, all our pictures were kind of aimless or you know, kind of foolish pictures. They were funny. Mm. But uh, this one had a story. And the audience was interested in the progress of Alan Jones and Kitty Carlisle. They didn't snicker when it first came out. No, they didn't. Yeah. Mike Nichols has been snickering now for 17 years. <laughs> uh, but after seeing Catch-22, yeah. he shouldn't complain too much either, you know. Did you like that? It had one wonderful scene. Yeah. That was the one with Alan Arkin. Well, it was, yeah. It was Wasn't a, it? He was in a lot of scenes. Oh, yeah, there was Yes, Orson Welles Arkin. was the general. Yeah, right. And uh, Alan Arkin comes in, and they're going to put a medal on him. Mm. Unfortunately, he's naked. Right. And there's no place for Orson Welles to hand put the medal. But it was Speak, a wonderful speaking scene. Speaking of that, did, is this story true about your first meeting with Thalberg when he kept you waiting? Yes, we had just come from the stage where we had done Animal Crackers and I'll Say She Is and Coconuts, mm -hmm. and we were pretty big shots in the theater. We, we got a lot of salary. And uh, when we got there, the first meeting we had with Thalberg, we were going to meet him at... Uh, about 10 o'clock. Yeah. So we got there at 10 o'clock. We were always very prompt. Is that at his office? It was his office, a very palatial office mm -hmm. with a huge fireplace and huge logs there for in the winter. It gets cold in California in the winter. And we sat there from 10 o'clock until lunchtime. And we never saw Thelberg. Because he was shooting four pictures at that time, one with Mark Connolly and with uh, one with F. Scott Fitzgerald. And... You know, the, we're guys from Broadway, the whole world. So uh, we sat there at 1 o'clock, and then we went out and had some lunch. Then we came back, and it was 2 o'clock, and we still hadn't seen Broadway. And it was 3 o'clock. Then we uh, sent one of the help to the uh, restaurant, mm -hmm. very, very fancy restaurant, and we bought uh, four potatoes, Mickey's, they called it. Raw potatoes? Yeah, raw potatoes, and we built a big fire in Thorberg's fireplace. <laughs> we took off all our clothes, and we sat there naked, the four of us. <laughs> and when Thorberg came back, we were sitting there naked, and we wouldn't let him in the office. <laughs> he said, no, he, he said, look, you kept us waiting five hours. He said, mm -hmm. we don't need you. We can go back to Broadway. What was the purpose of the potatoes? The potatoes was that uh, everybody else was going for lunch, and mm -hmm. we thought it'd be nice if we just have lunch in Thorberg's office. Yeah. And he never got angry with us after, because everybody was afraid of Thorberg, yeah. except us. Yeah. We didn't. Once we had cooked the potatoes, yeah. he kind of joined in with us. <laughs> because nobody, he never had any fun, Thorberg. He played bridge with Harpo at night, but that was about his only mm -hmm. fun he had. He built a home on the beach and had it soundproof so he couldn't hear the waves. <laughs> He's a very eccentric right. man. This is true. Gee, that's good. But he was certainly the greatest producer that Hollywood had. Yeah. And they have a building there now. It's called the Thalberg Building. Mm -hmm. I may have told you this, that uh, at that time, Greta Garbo was the biggest star in the movies. Yeah. Untouchable and beautiful. And uh, we used to take the elevator. It was four flights of stairs. Yeah. And we had gotten in the elevator on the first floor. And on the second floor, the door opens, and a woman steps in. And she's very well dressed. And she's got a big hat on, like a lot of women affecting now, some kind of strange, like merry widow hats or something. And I was kind of bored in the elevator, so I took the rear end of her hat. And I went like this. And she turns around, it's Garbo. <laughs> well, I was a little embarrassed. <laughs> And I said, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were a fellow I knew from Kansas City. <laughs> that was really a chutzpah because she was the big star in the whole movie yeah. industry. We'll be right back. We're back. Uh, there was so much yelling more and more when you were up singing. And 
no one ever gets tired of hearing Show Me a Rose. Well, I don't uh, object. I wouldn't. Um, maybe if we pulled the... Maybe if we pulled the stage back, because the people in the balcony can't always see you. Or, it, feels like California. We, uh, I, I, first of all, I didn't get an answer from you, whether you do show me a rose. Do you mind a moving stage? I don't care. Do, I? do you want me to do it here? <laughs> well, wherever you like. Still, I'll go down there. Yeah, use the stage. It's more fun. I may slip again. That's the edge. Ever since songwriters started writing songs, they have written songs about a rose. Red roses, blue roses, old roses, new roses, roses from the south and east and west. But here's the rose song that I love the best. We love the Who needs you? Show me a rose, and I'll show you a girl who cares. Show me a rose, or leave me alone. Show me a rose, and I'll show you a stag at bay. Show me a rose, or leave me alone. She taught me how to do the tango Down where the palm trees swayed I called a rose a mia And she called a spade a spade Show me a rose and I'll show you a storm at sea Show me a rose or leave me alone One night in Bixby, Mississippi We watched the clouds roll by I said, my dear, how are you? And she whispered, so am I Show me a rose And I'll show you a girl named Sam Show me a rose or leave me alone Show me a rose Show me a rose A fragrant rose A fragrant rose Make believe that you don't know me Until you show me A rose Yeah. You have to take a break first. Yeah. We got a message, and we'll be right back. Hey, talk with the other guests. Mm -hmm. It's great. We'll, oh, we'll be, here we are. Uh, would you like to meet a sloth? A slob? A, a sloth. I've met a number of them since I've been in the world. <laughs> How big a slob is he? It's a. <laughs> It's a sloth, actually. It's a, a small, medium. S-L-O-T-H, or maybe it's a sloth. Yeah, you could spell it, couldn't well, you? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. Is this from Nebraska? <laughs> no, it's not one of the Nebraska sloths. Jim Fowler is bringing this, oh. the sloth, or sloth. And is I thought... Book that, is this the fellow that wrote the book on English usage? Fowler? No, that's another Fowler. Is he a sloth, too? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I he, never know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have that problem with you, but uh, we make a good team. Let, will you welcome Jim Fowler and his sloth, please? You've been on here before. Oh, yeah. I saw you here with a bear or a, a monkey or yeah. all kinds of animals, yeah. huh? Sure. Is this your regular profession? He works real well with them, too, you know. Fearless. Not as, not as really good fearless. as you do. Yeah. Do you have a sloth concealed in your clothing? Yeah, or? 
we have a sloth that is going to be uh, coming on a little bit later. He's a little slow getting here. <laughs> oh, he's sloth-like. Do you have an eagle on the show? I had an eagle yeah, here. That was one, marvelous. Ago, yeah. I mean, he would fly from one end of the stage to the other. Right. You do watch? Yeah, I do watch. Well, when they have animals, I watch it. <laughs> I'm not crazy about people. No, but animals, animals, animals you I like. Love animals. What is the, is the sloth stuck back there, or is he worried, or is there any problem you're not telling me? We used me? to Has have a painted? duck in our show, in our yeah, quiz duck, show. Yeah. Maybe I could get them for you. You know, the only thing happened is, when they dropped the show, we ate them. Oh, that's Never sad. had a duck since then. I always liked that duck. You know, I get so, ma so much mail yeah. about the duck. They all want to know what the what? name of the duck is. And we never had a name for the duck. So wow. I, you know, I said, yeah. we called them mallard. Mallard. Which is a type of a duck. Yeah. And that seems to satisfy the people. They get an enormous amount of mail asking questions like that, foolish questions about the name of the duck. The name of the duck. People always want an animal to have a name. This is uh, mm -hmm. some reason. This sloth is called Gozo. And, uh, go Gogo? He's a two. <laughs> Did you say Gogo? Go Gozo. 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 He's a two toed sloth. And, uh, well, how does that differ from a one toes <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well, there is a three toed sloth, too. They, I don't know why, but they seem to. Well, are they. Uh, There's no one toed More un unfriendly if they're three toed? Well, you know, the fact, the fa for some reason, the three toed is more friendly than the two toed. The two toed has a sort of a nasty habit. That's the one we have here to. Oh, we, have the, we have the nasty one. But, uh, what, what nasty habit did he have the night he was here? <laughs> well, I've had a few that have had nasty habits. Uh, you must be the eagle, little... for example. Is... The eagle? Yeah, he they sometimes leave. the American the... bird? It he is. Has... Since the dissidents, anyhow. The he... dissidents? Yes. They had them in Washington at the public library there. The dissidents? Well, the dissidents were there screaming at these two gents walking into the library. That same eagle I, I had think here. I think one of them had been the chief president of one time. <laughs> You're right about that. That same eagle I had here, I had in the Waldorf one night and flew it from the balcony down to the stage, and uh, he left his mark on the Waldorf. <laughs> they very still point to it. Yeah. They feed, uh, I yeah. mean, at the Waldorf? Yeah, they are. They have. Stevenson used to live there, you know, <laughs> when he was running for the presidency. Your mind makes some strange leaps, I must say. <laughs> What's wrong about that? He's got a son now who's running for governor and a senator in Chicago. Ah, then it all makes sense. Yes, sir. <laughs> we, we, we'll meet our sloth after a message from our local station. We're about to see our uh, sloth. It is sloth, isn't it? Sloth, yeah. yeah. It's sloth. really one of the strangest, I think, of all the animals that I've I ever seen. Was sloth. Well, I, th I think both per, uh, like cold pronunciations are acceptable. Is he likely to leap? No, he's, uh, he does everything very carefully and very slowly. I don't see him yet. There's not, uh, oh, the audience can he'll see come him. out in just a second here. Come on, Gozo. Takes you, I give him an hey, instruction, and then it takes a little while before hey, he Look at that. I can't see him. You know, this is uh, something I discovered quite a while ago, that of all his foods that this sloth likes, he likes roses, usually at about I could sing Show Me a Rose again. <laughs> just He'll to keep him happy. Can you see him? You can't see him from I where I can't he's... see either of them. He'll climb up. And get I'm not much oh. interested in seeing him. Oh, isn't he? Oh, he's oh, a great Jesus. animal. Can you, would I dare pet him? Yeah, you can pet him, but I think I better put him on this broomstick. That's... Yeah. He seems to. Is he happy or upside down? He wants to down? have something that he can hold on to. I know I am. Come on. Here he is. <laughs> Come on. That's the lousiest looking dog I've ever seen. <laughs> there we go. Now we can see. Oh, he's terrific. The, uh, they live their life completely upside down. Mm -hmm. Very seldom ever uh, turn around. You know a couple of guys like that. Used to be called a massage parlor. <laughs> what? He's actually eating a rose, is it? Yeah, uh, you know, I know a fellow who once said to me, I know a massage parlor where you can get a massage. That's <laughs> 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 true. And then, oh, hard for What does that have to do with the sloth? No. 
Let's see if I can turn him around so the camera can see him a little better. Now, is he friendly to humans, and would he, will he attack them or bite them? or any, This uh... kind is fairly friendly. There's another uh, three-toed sloth that we were talking about. It's mm -hmm. even more friendly. But they're so specialized. They're very, very strange, and they, their yes. survival is, as the key to their survival is the fact they move so slow that very few things can see them. Uh -huh. And in the rainforest of South America, they actually grow a moss on their stomach. And uh, actually, really? that, that camouflage. And they hang but upside down most of their lives. All the time. So you can imagine. Uh, Do they have girlfriends like uh, animals? They have girlfriends, but there's, there's no danger of there being a population explosion. <laughs> they get around. <laughs> pretty uh, can there be any kind of an explosion? <laughs> Never. No kind of explosion with a slope. They're That's so a slow. It's a dull life they lead, and, hanging uh, on a broom. Even, <laughs> <laughs> even their. Uh, Jeez, They're wonderful. so specialized for this kind of living that the hair on their stomach is parted, goes mm -hmm. to either side, where most animals, you know, it's either on the top of the yeah. head like Groucho no. or on the back. Well, I was operated so. and I have hair here. <laughs> <laughs> the, sloth but, uh, the, other, the other nice thing about it, so it's I don't recommend... It's hard to conceal an operation. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that's true. Especially <laughs> now. Unless you have a lot of hair. <laughs> Does a sloth ever have a runny nose? He's always upside down. I guess he probably doesn't have to well, this worry one, about that. This one likes bananas, and he sort of gets them all over him. But oh, uh, that's the name of Woody's picture. The, uh, huh. one, of the, one, of the nice, uh, one of the nice things about having a sloth as a pet, although I don't recommend exotic pets too often, but these yeah. are great because you can put them in a, in a tree in your living room, and they just, <laughs> they just hang around all day. <laughs> Didn't Truman Capote live in a tree at one time. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. Well, we'll let I him answer that question. Either that, or uh, he wrote a book about living in a tree. He well, may well, have been Brooklyn. I, I'm, I'm sure he'll be feel, glad to clear that up for us. Do you feel the hair on him, though? Because the... Oh, be oh yes. Yeah. Do you want to feel the slug? Yeah. You want me to feel him? Yeah. <laughs> There's a dame in the third row I prefer. <laughs> <laughs> if I have my choice. All right. You have an enormous Jeez, amount of wonderful. patience, don't you? Well, with, with a sloth, you, your patience is not tested too often, but... Uh, mm -hmm. No, but I've seen I had it with a, other animals. Yes, with other animals, definitely. You know, it's funny, I had, with a, an eagle? I had a uh, sloth giving a talk once, and he came like this at me, grazed my face, and after the show, a lady came up and said, Mr. Fowler, I could just tell that your animal loves you. I yeah. said, Madam, that was a fast jab. <laughs> it really was. That's about how a sloth attacks you. But With Thank elephants you. and a few things like that, uh, you've really got to watch out and know a little bit about it. Yeah, so come yeah. back tonight and tell us a lot about elephants because I know you just did some, you lived with some elephants recently. Yeah, You've I, just been living with yeah, elephants. I just got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after this message from our local state. We're back. Here's one of America's best writers and most interesting people uh, to talk to, and uh, I just learned that he lived in a tree at one point. I don't know if that's true or not. Will you welcome, please, Mr. Truman Capote? Try the hat. Um, uh, no, I can't. I don't need a hat with three balls. I'm just an average person. <laughs> well, that's, that's explaining it clearly. You know the last. <laughs> the, the well, last I don't. Time, uh, I don't think I'd want to remain. <laughs> you, you last time where? The last time I was on your program was our charming evening with that delicious gentleman, Governor Maddox. Remember? Oh, I, that's right. When he got that's up right. and walked off. Well, Is that the last time you were here? Yep, that was yeah. the last time. But uh, all of these people in Georgia, various uh, readers of mine, when I, <clears throat> after that, kept sending me um, transcripts of a program that Governor Maddox talked on in Atlanta <laughs> called Atlanta Today. I meant to send it to you. He had quite mm. a lot to say about us. <laughs> all yeah. of it libelous. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I'd love to see that if you have a copy of it. I do. Yeah. I think he's coming on again. Who is that? I think he is. Is this Maddox? a private conversation you two are having? Oh, no. <laughs> Who am I supposed to, supposed Would to you? talk to? That animal he's got in the box? <laughs> <laughs> that sloth. I would like to engage in this conversation. I, I know how in he some can. capacity. All right, here's a, let me give you a capacity. All you right, said earlier that, gallons. <laughs> you said earlier that you'd be a better writer if you had gone to college. This and, is true, oh, I, I think so. I wonder if you agree. 
with that with that. I didn't finish high school. I didn't yeah. finish public school. Mm -hmm. so? I went to PS 86 at 96th Street in Lexington Avenue. It's yeah. now been turned down, or burned down, or torn down. Yeah. Anyhow, we used to go. Go on, he talked. What can you do? You think writing can be taught effectively in uh, colleges? No. no, I mean I don't think that, I think journalism can be taught. Yeah. But I don't think creative writing can be taught because. Uh, what, the only thing that happens is that in a creative writing class, at least the student in, has a captive audience, which is the other students, mm -hmm. you know, to give, submit his work to or the professor, and he gives him some encouragement in his work. But I don't. It's, I think it's impossible to uh, instill any any uh, creative process, whether it's writing or music or painting, in a person who isn't naturally creative. Mm -hmm. We can learn a certain technique, but that's all. I don't think you can teach somebody to act. Do you? Teach what? I don't think you teach can someone teach to someone act. to act. I thought he said uh, he wanted to know if I know a rat. <laughs> <laughs> he talks very softly, this man. I know, you're sitting a long ways apart. Uh, I'll, I'll filter the things over, you would, you over to you. Push the chair over, isn't it? Yeah. I'll sit on his lap and talk to him. <laughs> he, maybe he could train me to do something. <laughs> Like that eagle you have. Have you ever wanted to hang upside down on a broom? I guess not. No, but, but he question. told me the toughest thing to train, actually, is a rat. Because oh. it's so much like a human being. <laughs> he wasn't being comic. He told me this while you two were whispering to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I said that rats are, are very smart, so sometimes they're harder to train. The easiest animals to train are the, are the dumber animals stupid animals, but... So and a rat's cagey and smart. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Well, is it, does it have the highest intelligence of the no. rodents? Well, of the rodents, mm -hmm. yes, I would say so. You had well, that fellow on your show once, a fellow named McCormick, a big, tall fellow, very funny. He's a writer. Right, Pat McCormick. And he was working for Don Rickles. Yeah. And, uh, and it was the first show, I think, and McCormick said to the audience, Mr. Rickles will be a little late tonight because he's out walking his rat. That's right. That's his joke. That's a very funny joke. He made that. A, it is funny. Yeah. And it resembled Rickles so much, you know. Yeah. The, the joke or the... Uh... No, the joke. Yeah. Do you have any animals? Yes. <laughs> I've... Uh... You don't have a rat you're not using, huh? No. I have uh, two cats and a dog. Yeah. But you don't Do they keep... mate? Uh, not with each other, no. You're pretty shifty, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> elusive, elusive, not shifty. <laughs> I don't know how to handle wanna, all this. But... I want to ask you one question. Uh, this may be a, a joke. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Did you once write a book about living in a tree? Yes. Well, see, I was right. But you said he once lived in a tree. Well, and I was I... a little confused at the time. <laughs> But he did write a book about living in a tree. I wrote a book and a play called The Grass Harp. And yeah, it was about the people who uh, lived in a tree house. Yeah. Yeah. There you are. So, so I'm I sorry. think I'll leave now. <laughs> I wouldn't I'm properly that. crushed here. Yeah. You said your brother used to play one. Uh, you know, I was going to ask something earlier. Which brother were you the closest to? I think Gummo. We, we roomed together. Some people, you know, don't know there is a Gummo. They, they know he doesn't know. <laughs> no, I mean, you know. I remember Gummo had a son, yeah. and Gummo at one time was in the army in the First World War, mm -hmm. and uh, Gummo had a kid, seven years old. And in school one day, they asked the teacher asked all the children what their father did for a living. And uh, when it came to this, his, the boy's name was Bobby, and the teacher said, "What does your father do?" Now he didn't want to say he was in the army. So he said, uh, he said, yeah, oh yes, he said, he's a general in the army. And Gummo was annoyed at this. Why did you say that he, I was a general in the army? I wasn't a general, I was a private. And the boy said, well, who knows you? And that's really, all there is to it. Was Gummo upset by that? Yes, Gummo was disturbed by that and finally yeah. went back into show business. <laughs> where he had no talent at all. I, but Zeppo was the... Was Zeppo the, was also in the yeah. act. Yeah. Did you know there were five Marx Brothers? There were six. I just One knew there were five. At the age of four. Is that right? 
Yeah. And it's a strange thing because my mother only spoke German and my father only spoke French. How they got together to have six kids, I never found out. But it's yeah. true. We had there were six boys. Yeah. Do you have brothers and sisters? No. No. You have cat, two cats and a dog. <laughs> That's it. Would you, <laughs> would you consider throwing in a rat? <laughs> Do you ever resent anyway. it when people say, if when they find out you're an only child, they always say, ah, I knew it. Have you ever, does that happen to you? That happens to me. They say, ah, I could have guessed. I never have known what people mean by that exactly. It was difficult for well, us to do because the there were five brothers. <laughs> yeah, it would have been absurd. You couldn't say it, but we were the only children. No. Although you could say we were only children. You, this is true. Yeah. I didn't know you went to Yale. <laughs> I thought it was Rutgers. You like the name Rutgers, don't I you? I do, yes. Yeah. Harry Boone used yeah. to write about Rutgers a great yeah. deal. Yeah. Do you feel that Truman is dominating the conversation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to say one thing. <laughs> if you'll forgive me, I would like to say one thing. Okay. And that was said by General MacArthur when, the, when Truman, not you, the other Truman, fired MacArthur, and MacArthur had said, never fight a land war in Asia. And right after that, the president fired him, Truman. That's right, MacArthur did this say that. True. A lot of yes, people, he did. Uh, and if everybody else had remembered that, we yeah. wouldn't have a couple of hundred thousand boys that are dead. Now, you may proceed, Mr. Capote. We have certainly set him up nicely. For, uh, uh, first he follows a sloth, and now... Uh, yes, no. but at least he's a professional writer. Yeah. Which is more than I can say for the rest of this group. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I thought you, you've written five books, haven't you? Yes, oh, yeah. Yeah. And Dick was a professional writer? Well, I was a comedy writer. That's not the same as writing. Oh, really? I think it's the hardest form of writing there is. But it's, it comes you in quick... Better. It comes in quick bursts. It doesn't, isn't anything that you have to sit out and do over a long period of time, like writing a novel or plotting out a book. It's yes, a, but I mean, comic novel writing is uh, at least a writer like Evelyn Waugh. Yeah. You know, he was a great comic writer. Who's that? Evelyn Waugh, English novelist. Yes, yes. Uh, and Ring Lautner wasn't bad either. But I don't consider him a comic. Really? I don't consider Ring Lardner a comic writer. You know, well, I mean, he's, he's a dramatic writer, actually. Yes, he is. When he wrote uh, Haircut <laughs> and all those books that he wrote, they were a Golden Wedding and all those. Eventually, was another one. Yeah. And Lardner, of course, I was always crazy about Lardner. I found that the people who liked those writers of that period often always say that Lardner was. They often say Lardner was the best. Oh, well, I think he was. I don't know close why. to her during that era. And he had some sons who came out to be pretty good writers, too. Yeah. His Ring Lardner, I think, who got the Academy Award, didn't he? For MASH. He and then there was John Lardner, who used to be a sports writer on the, the New, Yorker. New Yorker magazine. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole family of writers, but he couldn't write at home. He'd go to the Pennsylvania Hotel, he'd take a couple of quarts of whiskey, and he'd close the windows and pull down the shades and get drunk, and then he'd start writing. Yeah, a lot of writers get drunk to write, don't they? Oh, yes. Eventually yeah. was drunk most of the time. Yeah. I don't think anybody can write when they're drinking. When they're drinking? Not really. <clears throat> I, I, I think that it's impossible for a, uh, for a person to really write if they're, uh, uh, while they're drinking. Wasn't what can it? happen is that a, you, a writer can write and get, uh, uh, say, a day's work done. At the end of the day, he can take two or three drinks and something in it loosens uh, him up and so that he can go through what he's done and suddenly get a kind of inspiration in his rewriting. But it's impossible to, to drink and write well, at the same time. Sinclair a drug Lewis and write, which is a, an a amazing drunk. thing. What? St. Clair Lewis was a big drunk. Yes, but he wasn't drink. He couldn't be writing and drinking at the same time. Mm, it's impossible. Yeah. Perhaps not. Unfortunately, I'm not doing either. <laughs> <laughs> what I think is so curious is the whole idea of taking drugs and writing, because it doesn't yeah. work. If, if there's any one thing in the world that requires total concentration, it's writing. And yet there are a few writers who claim they, they wrote with drugs, although you can usually tell it, I, I always feel. Tell me, one, tell me one writer. They wrote when they, they were at stud, did you say? <laughs> did you say that? No, I said, well, it, under the influence of drugs. 
Oh, drugs. I thought you expensive. said when they were at stud, they couldn't write well. <laughs> well, it's kind of difficult. Have you ever noticed that everything that you hear wrong has the, a common theme running through it? <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, <laughs> Unfor me. Unfortunately, it's getting less common over time. <laughs> right. We have a message. We'll be right back. Uh, don't you have a book about to appear now? For a couple of years, we've been waiting for answered prayers. Mm. And uh, have you turned it over to the publisher yet? No. I refer to it now as my posthumous novel. Because yeah. either I'm going to kill it or it's going to kill me. It's just yeah. sort of like an English Chinese dinner. It grows and grows. I can't seem to get to the bottom of it. It isn't that you don't know how to touch type that's holding it up or anything. <laughs> I, I write longhand. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I can only write by dictating. Really? I cannot write with a typewriter or a lead pencil. You dictate to a secretary? I dictate to a secretary, yes. Yeah. Henry James dictated uh, the last... I tell you about Henry James. Mm -hmm. Some woman in South Carolina or someplace, she uh, visited Hollywood and she wanted to meet me that I was a great fan of Henry James. Mm -hmm. And she invited me to come down to some town in the South and if I would talk about uh, Henry James, well, I don't know any more about Henry James than I did. And I wrote her a letter and said, you had me confused. I'm very familiar with the works of Jesse James and, <laughs> and Harry James, who was married to Betsy Grable or something. But I don't know anything about Henry James, and I didn't. And I never had to go to that town. <laughs> but they had sent me the money first to come down there. And so I made a little profit. More than I made with this guy in the front row here. He's my <laughs> financial advisor. Mm. He dropped 10 points on me today. Yeah. What man is that? Well, the, I don't like to identify lawyers, him <laughs> because uh, his reputation is none too good as it is. <laughs> and uh, he's sitting there and in the front row yet besides, so everybody would be sure to know if I mention him who he actually is. Mm. When the market crashed in 29, I engaged him as my financial advisor, and we've been together since then. And that's about 40 years. Started with a crash. And started, <laughs> ever since. started with a crash, yes. Yeah. Is it true that once during the, during the stock market crash, or at some point you went down and appeared at the stock exchange yes, itself? Yes, I did, and I sang, uh, When Irish Eyes Are Smiling on the Stock Exchange. <laughs> For no particular reason, except I was so angry at, the, at Wall Street yeah. And I was using him at that time. Mm -hmm. But uh, over the years, we've been fairly successful together. He uh, is very conservative, very shrewd. And I suggest almost everybody in the audience who hasn't got any money to get a hold of this man. <laughs> he will wipe you out almost instantly. Have you ever thought how you'd feel if all your money were taken away from you, could you live? It happened to me today. What? It happened to me today. How? Well, for five years, I've been having a controversy with the Internal Revenue Service, and today yeah. they settled it. <laughs> and they just took all my money away. <laughs> After five years of controversy, yesterday, it was announced today what the settlement was going to be, so that was the end of it. It was not in your favor. No, I'm just going to have to walk the streets with my prices strapped to my back <laughs> from now on. <laughs> Have you ever thought about I, I living don't... in a tree? I think <laughs> that is terrible news to get. Did they listen to your arguments and? For five years, yes. And, yeah. But I have to pay five years of fines for having talked to them for so long. You know, long. you can cure that by getting married. You can split the taxes that way. <laughs> split the taxes? Who if you, you can. suggest well, that I get If you're married a single to... man, you pay a much bigger <laughs> income tax than if you're a married man. I didn't realize that. Well, it's true. So there are advantages to being yes, married. Yes, that's about the only one that I can think of. Yeah. <laughs> that when you're all home alone at night mm -hmm. in a single bed, it doesn't help any. No. But uh, if you have a companion with you who is, uh, listen, will listen to reason, mm -hmm. I think there is money to be made in income tax. I think we can all profit from that lesson. Um, I'm not sure exactly how, but it sounded fine. Truman, yeah. have you ever thought of getting married and splitting the tax? 
Will you find somebody for me to marry, and I'll consider it, okay? As, I would, as long I would as marry you, you in a minute if you were not <laughs> write another hit book like you did about Kansas. Yeah. Did you read Gun Cold Blood? Yes, of course I did. Yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah. Will you, will you consider this an engagement? Yes, positively. <laughs> yeah. Positively. You're a little old for me, though. That's wrong. I can't give you what you're entitled to. We're, we're, the best years of your life. We'll be, we'll be back probably. I don't. <laughs> the time has flown away, and we have um, not much left. In fact, about 30 seconds, and that's time to thank Truman Capote and Groucho Marx and Jim Fowler and the Sloth. And uh, all of you come back again. You here? You hear? I don't know. Can you get him again? Yeah. yeah. He and may we'll have stay. other animals. Thank you. We'll, we'll have see you it. ever brought an elephant on the show? <laughs> Please, I have enough problems. We'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs>